Welcome to Strange Familiars. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, you can email us strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Right now, we're pretty booked up for interviews, but I always will take Bigfoot stories, in particular Bigfoot stories involving high strangeness. We'll make space for you if you have those stories. But of course, we want to hear all of your stories. Again, you can just email us strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Tonight is the return of Brother Richard to our show. If you didn't listen to Brother Richard before, he was on about a year ago. If you go back and check out A Monastic View of the Other, was the first episode Brother Richard was on. One of my all-time favorite episodes. And I'm going to have to say, I'm sure this is going to be another. I was racking my brain, trying to figure out what to do for a Christmas show this year. And then... Seems hit, pretty obvious. Yeah, I have <laughs> the ultimate guest. So with Brother Richard, we're going to be talking about Christmas stories and legends, angels, Mary Magdalene, the Three Magi, the Holy Grail, St. Francis' teachings, and more. Do not miss the stories that Brother Richard relates of his personal experiences. Some amazing stories in there as well. Fantastic chat. It's a long one. It's over two hours. It's worth it, though, but it, it went really quickly. Yeah. I could have talked to him for two more hours. I really could have. I want to thank Brother Richard so much for doing that. For waking up in the middle of the night to do it from the time difference. and Yeah, exactly. In the early part of the interview, he talks about the work that he and his brothers do with the homeless. And if you'd like to help with that, there's two places you can donate. The first one is capuchindaycenter.ie, and that's the mission in Ireland. And that's C-A-P-U-C-H-I-N. D-A-Y-C-E-N-T-R-E, capuchindaycenter.ie. The American site, if you want to donate to a similar mission in America, it's cskdetroit.org. And I'll put links to both of those in the show notes. We donated to both. Uh, I think if you can afford to help out, it's a great cause, and it's a great time of year to do that, I think. Again, that's capuchindaycenter.ie and cskdetroit.org. I'll put the links in the show notes. We'll mention it again after the interview. But let's go ahead and get to our Christmas episode with Brother Richard. I'd like to welcome back to the show Brother Richard how are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. It's great to be back. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So excited to have you back for a Christmas show. How has 2020 been for you? It's a dangerous question to ask anybody at the moment. Um, right. I, I suppose it's like like everybody else. Uh, it's been it's been a crazy time. Uh, it's also been a time of um, I suppose great insight. Um, it has certainly drawn us back into the things that matter I think you know uh, community family friendship support all of those things that are really important um, but it has certainly been difficult there's no doubts about that and uh, we've been quite lucky uh, here in, in Ireland in, in that um, while uh, we've had waves of, of the, the disease and we've had um, various periods of lockdown by and large thankfully um, we've come through it reasonably okay i would say the government was very proactive here from the start it helped that at the time our, our prime minister the Taoiseach, as we call him he was a, a medical doctor himself so i think he took things very very seriously from the beginning and there's been some resistance of course along the way and some kind of naysayers and all of that kind of stuff but it's been a year that i think anyone who has come through it and lived through it is going to remember for a very long time i think that's uh, absolutely the case for for almost all of us how have your duties changed as far as 
bit? Well, I've I've moved since the last time we spoke. Um, I'm now attached to one of our friaries, which is in inner city Dublin, a very very old place. Um, the friars first arrived here in 1615. Wow. Uh, so we've been living here on this site uh, since the 1600s. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a place that's quite soaked in the sort of lived experience of, of monastic life. Um, the main work of the community uh, in this place is we have a, a day centre for the homeless. So we provide meals and free uh, medical attention and, and um, counselling for about 900 homeless people every day. Um, so it's yeah, it's quite an undertaking. Huge team of volunteers helping us with that. Brother Kevin is the name of the brother who who uh, founded it way back in 1967, um, and it has sadly, uh, because of necessity, it has gotten bigger and bigger ever since. Uh, but it's it's funded um, in part by the government. The government gives a small uh, donation towards it, and the rest of it then is all. Uh, fundraised um, from the, the general public, uh, offering kind of donations and things like that. So we provide breakfast service, dinner service, um, family counselling, free legal representation, and there's also a free medical and dental clinic as well. Wow, that sounds like good work. Thank yeah, you for yeah, what you it's, do. It's thank, thank you and, and your fellow uh, brethren for that. Well, we, we do what we can. Um, the, the, the philosophy, I think, of uh, St. Francis was, you know, you arrive into a place and the first question you ask of anyone is, is what do you need? And, and that sadly is one of the biggest needs um, in, in our particular society at the moment. Uh, and with the, uh, with the pandemic, one of the, the difficulties, of course, has been many people have lost work. Um, many people have come to experience great difficulty in terms of... Um, mortgages, housing, etc. Um, the same as, as everywhere really in the world. But So we're, we're seeing a, quite a rise in, in those availing of the services at the moment. I can only imagine, yeah. Mm. You know, approaching Christmas in mm. this unusual year, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. it's not been like any year I can remember. No, indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. I suppose for us, you know, there is a certain sense of it moves in the same way as it always has in the sense that we, we move into the Advent season. We're, we're, we're in it now. We're in the second week of Advent, which in our tradition is four weeks of preparation, uh, spiritual preparation for the feast itself. It's kind of like a little a little Lent, um, a time of uh, fasting and, and deeper prayer. But whereas Lent would have a very penitential feel to it, the Advent is more kind of expectancy. It's sort of uh, preparing for in a, in a kind of a more joyous way, preparing for for the feast of Christmas. So um, yeah, there's deeper prayer. A little bit of of fasting goes on during it, um, and uh, kind of just interior spiritual preparation as well for for the feast. So that would happen regardless of what what else is happening in the outside world. The difference for us this year is going to be the kind of services we have. So because again of, of COVID restrictions, we're we're severely limited in terms of the numbers we can have at services and things like that. We've only just recently gone back to public services. Everything was online until recently. So it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be the first Christmas uh, in a long time where carol singing isn't allowed uh, within oh. the churches. It's allowed outside, but not within the churches right? Yeah. Uh, for fear of uh, contamination. So, yeah, it's going to be quite a quite a silent <laughs> silent night, <laughs> if, you, if you'll, if you'll uh, pardon the pun. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. All right, yeah. Well, at the beginning of all of this, uh, and I don't know how many of our listeners know, but uh, you mm-hmm. had written a poem that just took off. And I mean, I guess the best word for it is it went viral. Yeah, yeah, it really did, um, and, and took me aback. I've, I've worked with poetry for years uh, in, in terms of, of um, just kind of as part of my um, I've enjoyed it and it's part of my, my kind of spiritual uh, life uh, poetry, prayer, meditation those kind of things go, go together for me and one leads to the other and just around about that time um, I'd had a day where I'd we were all in shock as the, the, the pandemic was sort of kicking off but um, I was very aware of the fact that in the midst of all of that, there was good news happening as well. And so there were three separate incidents I heard in one day. Um, the fact that over in Assisi, uh, in Italy, where the city of St. Francis, where he lived, that the people who were already on severe lockdown over there in Italy uh, were, were singing to each other across the, the streets um, so as to kind of keep a sense of community. And uh 
then uh, there was a, a young lady that, that I knew and, uh, and taught years ago. Um, she's now a qualified uh, lawyer, but because she couldn't practice and couldn't work in her office, uh, she was setting up a service to assist um, the elderly in her neighborhood. And there were all these lovely, you know, community-based stories of just people reaching out. And so I sat down and wrote a kind of a mini reflection and posted it on, on Facebook and Instagram, as I usually do. And I promptly went to bed and forgot all about it. Um, and I got up the next morning and um, had something like, I think it was uh, three three or 4,000 uh, messages um, had, had arrived in overnight. And that's not the normal way I, I, I get up at all. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, with, within, within a very short time, it had just shot around the world. As best I know now, it has been shared well over a million times. That's at least the ones that I can kind of uh, track. Uh, it's been translated into about 28 languages. Wow. Um, there's two orchestral pieces, a drama piece, two short movies. Um, it's uh, all created based on it, three or four animations. Um, and it goes on and goes on and goes on. And it's still, it's still going on. Um, people are still finding it. I think the nicest, or one of the nicest uh, contacts I had was with a, uh, a women's collective in India who were, were working to try and um, use the poem as a way of reflecting not just on the lockdown, the pandemic lockdown, but just the experience uh, for themselves as women and the way in which they were living in, in, in their society. Uh, so it's it's been fascinating to kind of walk it, watch it walk. I, I've called it the little poem with the long legs. You know, yeah. it, it keeps it keeps going. So uh, yeah, it's been fascinating. Uh, I mean, in terms of the states, um, the, the big move move there, and that created a, another huge wave. Was um, Anderson Cooper on CNN read the poem yeah. um, aloud, and <laughs> I was fielding fielding. Uh, requests for interviews and all the rest of it for for a very long time so i might be be comfortable on podcasts about the other but i, I certainly had never intended to be on cnn or anything <laughs> else um but uh yeah th thankfully things have kind of quietened down a bit but i'm if there's anybody out there listening to this who has emailed me or contacted me and is still wondering why they haven't heard from me it's because it's just bursting still with with messages and, and mails and requests and i'm slowly getting through it all so yeah oh that must be the i mean that amazing like like it just must be an amazing feeling because you know the poem was written in a sense to mm. maybe give people a sense of peace and and solace sure going yeah. into and, lockdown and, and then just to have it just get everywhere like that just go i mean i saw it uh there were actresses uh, Alyssa milano had yes yeah anderson cooper yeah. of course and then uh I had people contacting me saying, this, "Is that your brother, Richard?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's not mine, but yeah, that was the, the, the uh, one. Yeah, it was. It was fascinating to see where it went and and how it how it kind of moved by itself. I mean, I've always said when people ask me, you know, it, not just with the lockdown poem, but other poems, you know, did you write it? My my feeling always with regard to poetry is is you know, yes, you kind of write it, but it also sort of comes comes through you as well if it's flowing well, you know, as mm -hmm. with any creative work. Um, and so in that sense, you know, you, you can own it as an author, but really it belongs to, to everyone. It, it emerges. And I guess I was just the point in which it, it emerged into, into people's consciousness at, at this point. So, you know, it's, it's, gone, it's gone around and who, who knows who knows where it will land next. The funniest thing of all was qu quite often I'm being sent the poem. Um, by people who who say you like poetry, you'll probably like this poem. Um, <laughs> who, who don't know where where it has come from. So, yeah, occasionally it comes home like a little homing pigeon to to sort of sit with me again for a while. But, oh, that's um, wonderful! Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Well, I guess we'll get into our Christmas uh, questions. Sure. For the sure. Night. I guess before the questions that other people submitted, I always have this fascination with what we call here old Christmas, mm -hmm. uh, which is. Uh, Basically, the, it's it's just the date Christmas was celebrated, what, before, how, oh, I, I forget the, was it before the Gregorian calendar? I forget. Mm -hmm. um, the Gregorian calendar, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the, we're, in, we're, we're, we're with at the moment, yeah. And some people, you know, some traditions held on to it and remembered it, and, and other people just, you know, when it, when, you know, December 25th kind of became the official Christmas date, it kind of faded from some other traditions. You know, does the church or do you, you know, individually acknowledge old Christmas in any ways or any sort of celebration or, or feast associated with that? 
you're, you're talking about the sixth of January, are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so for for us, that's that's the 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 epiphany. So, um, it, it's sort of the 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 twelfth night. Um, it's it's the 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 uh, the marker of the the end of the Christmas period proper as mm-hmm. such. And there were lots of traditions around it. Um, decorations in in the house were supposed to be taken down on twelfth night. It was considered very bad luck to leave them up in the house after after the twelfth. It was also in Ireland known as Nolignaman in, in Gaelic, which was the women's Christmas or little Christmas. And the idea there was that the women having worked extremely hard and uh, to to um, uh, to cook and, and to provide for all the festivities, this was the day when they were allowed to, to rest. And it was up to the men to cook and to clean on that day, um, a kind of a sort of a, a reversal um, Though, though, uh, as most women will, will tell you, they immediately noticed that the, the men got twelve days and they got one, which is the <laughs> usual, the usual uh, proportion. Sadly, in in, in terms of, of honouring, but it was honoured, and it was also a day in which um, women very often made pilgrimages together to to holy wells or to holy trees, etc. And as to what transpired there, I don't know. I'm <laughs> uh, uh, not being being part of of that gender, but it was it was considered a, a very special and a very sacred time. Um, within the Christian calendar, it is the uh, the day in which we would commemorate the the baptism of Christ, uh, the miracle of the uh, wedding feast at Cana, and the visit of the the, the, the Magi, the three wise men. Um, so, in places where the the Christmas crib or crash was was uh, was placed, that was the day on which the three wise men arrived uh, and were, were were placed into the crib if they hadn't been placed there already. So I think we'll be talking about the Magi later. So, so there's there's a lot a lot about the Magi and, and and their significance, but Epiphany comes from the Greek Epiphanoia, which means a showing forth or a revealing, and the, the idea was that that while Christmas was the, the the revelation to the shepherds and to the people of of Israel, the Epiphany was the showing forth of the Christ to the whole world. Uh, so we have the first of his public signs um, as an adult, the, the uh, turning of the water into wine at Cana. We have the um, the first uh, kind of revelation of the Trinity with the baptism of Christ in the, in the waters of the Jordan, in which 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 was also seen as a rendering of all water as a holy and sacred and healing element from then on, and was even seen as a sort of a casting out of any sort of negative spirits that would have been in water, so that water was considered a, a very sacred element from that moment. And then the third uh, point then, as I say, was the Magi. So you have the, the uh, in inverted commas, the pagan peoples, as they would have been seen in the old tr- traditions, coming and making their, their adoration of, of the Christ as well, and that their faiths and their traditions had pointed them towards the coming of, of the Christ. So that was the old date in the Orthodox Christian tradition, in the Eastern tradition. That would still be the the, the, the main day on which the, the birth of Christ is also celebrated on, on that day. So all of those mysteries would have been celebrated together. So they kind of held on to the, the old while they while they moved on to the, the newer calendar of the Gregorian, which was also made to um, to illustrate, I suppose, the uh, the, the, the sort of um, the use of, of the whole year as a kind of a catechetical tool or teaching tool. So the reason we choose 25th of December is for two reasons. Number one is... Uh, the nearness to the winter solstice uh, um, and and the great uh, Roman pagan feast of Sol Invictus, which was the the, the victorious sun. So the sun, the sun, as in S U uh, N, died was seen to die in the pagan mysteries on the shortest day of the year. Uh, and then there were a number of days of mourning for the sun. Uh, and then by the twenty fifth, of course, the the sun is beginning to appear again over the horizon, and so that the sun is seen to be to be victorious. And that was a one of the most important feasts in um, the classical uh, um, classical religions, and so when Christianity came about, it was seen that that this feast uh, presaged or or um, prefigured uh, the coming of the sun S O N in in that sense, uh, and so the the feast of Christmas uh, was began to be celebrated quite publicly from about the three hundreds round about that 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 uh, festival that date. Do they refer to it as Old Christmas Day there as well? Uh, little Christmas. Little Christmas. Okay. Uh, th- yeah, okay. yeah. Little Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of, a lot of big celebration there for that. Yeah. Folklorically speaking, like uh, just I've noticed just in you know mm. folklore and collecting stories and stuff, folk songs and so forth. There is almost a mystical quality assigned to old old Christmas. 
Like, yeah. Like for those who remembered it, you know, like like the, okay, we have Christmas, but there's also old Christmas as well. Which yeah, I'm yeah, it's kind of an echo in the background. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ab- absolutely. And it was seen as a very, very liminal space. As I say, first of all, you have the, you had the reversal of the genders going on. Mm-hmm. You had the uh, the visits to to the old places, um, the wells and the and the, and the trees and and those kind of sacred places. Often monastic ruins were often visited on those days as well. They were kind of pilgrimages and pattern days. Um, you have the arrival of these. Uh, mystics, these three great mystics, the three, the three magi, and so it was. It was one of those times uh, in in which um, uh, I suppose a thin time in, in in that sense when the dead were also very often commemorated on the Epiphany, and it would have I suppose linked in to to the kind of um, the ending of the solstice, the turning towards the light again. All of those kind of things uh, would it would still echo within within that that old Christmas day. So uh, we'll get to some of the questions that sure. people submitted now. This says uh, this is from Taylor. He said, for both mm-hmm. Tim and Brother Richard, what are some scary Christmas stories that have impressed <laughs> or shocked you, if any? And we'll just mm-hmm. start with that one. For me, it's the, I mean, you guys can go back and listen to the Belsnickel episode. The fact that these wild men are so closely mm-hmm. associated with the holidays and, again, my chapters on... Uh, the wild man and Christmas and, and where the footprints end and so forth. I think I've talked about that at some length. Very, very interesting that these sort of uh, all over Europe and uh, in America in those communities like, like the Pennsylvania Dutch community here, there's, there's people that, that you know have these uh, folkloric ties mm. to Europe. These folkloric wild men are just associated with Christmas so closely. Very, very uh, interesting to me. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 extraordinary, um, and and the, the the sort of bringing bringing together the, the the those various wild wild man and 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 uh, uh, kind of punishing figures, I suppose, and and then bringing them into the company of Saint Nicholas of Santa Claus as well is 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 fascinating. You know, the idea that they are in some way his his kind of retinue. As he as he goes around, um, they've been scrubbed from the record somewhat uh, um, officially. But but uh, yeah, the, the idea of of Christmas as a kind of a wild time, um, as as a time of of wildness and encountering the wild, both in humanity and in in the, the kind of uh, spirits of the land or the spirits of the other, is is, is quite a, a present one. Within within the, the the Irish tradition, there are lots of stories of encounters, particularly with the the kind of the fairy world, uh, round about Christmas, um, and also the lament uh, very often of the fairies that they were sort of on the outside of these celebrations, that they couldn't um, partake of it or be, oh, or be isn't part that of it. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. There was the, that, that. That was quite often, often done. And in fact, it, it, they were one of the times in which it was very easy to see them. They had all of these kind of rituals, um, particularly with regard to to the clergy. Uh, it was supposed to to be um, on Christmas Eve that if you managed to get um, a hold of of a saddle that had been used uh, by a priest and put your foot in the stirrup. Uh, while hold, putting your other foot on fairy ground, you would be able to see the fairies. And for um, those those kind of clergy who were c- considered to be holier, uh, if they made a loop or a ring with their arm um, touching their hip and you looked through it uh, towards a fairy mound, you were supposed to be able to see the fairies on Christmas Eve as well. So there was this idea of, of that... that uh, while you know we have silent night and all is peaceful and all is quiet, um, there was this idea that that there was a great upheaval. That Christmas brings a great upheaval, a great shift, a great movement um, with regard to the spiritual world. And even within the very earliest monastic texts, one work that's known as the Sayings of the Desert Fathers, uh, there's a wonderful story about Saint Anthony of the Desert, who's one of the very very early monastic saints. And he meets uh, a satyr uh, in the desert, <clears throat> a wild man, and he's described as as a, one, of, one of the classical satyrs, uh, who tells him that he also needs to have the gospel preached to him, uh, and that they have been waiting um, for the for the revelation to come to them as well. And so the the uh, Saint Anthony sits down and 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 teaches him, you know, uh, tells him the story of the Christ and the coming of the Christ. Um, so it, it's a th- it's a sort of a a theme that that's present uh, from the from the very beginning, wow, uh, all yeah. the way through. Yeah, you'll find that in the the very early uh, early chapters of the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. 
And I, I, what's lovely about it is St. Anthony is on his way somewhere else and kind of meets this guy uh, in the middle of the desert who asks him to stop. And he's kind of, um, uh, you know, he, he's not uh, in any way disturbed by the fact that he's meeting a satyr in the middle of the <laughs> desert. He's just annoyed that he can't get on to his appointment. So it's it's uh, it's one of those things, you know, again, the, the, the old fairy idea of, um, you know, you'll be stopped on the road and not to uh, not to pass that which is in need uh, is, is, a, is a very important Christmas Christmas point. I suppose if you're looking for a scary Christmas story, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether it's scary or not. I, I encountered m- myself some years ago a house that that uh, a young couple had had bought. Um, they were friends of one of the other friars, and they were having a little bit of issue with one of their their youngest children. Who kept telling them that there was a, a man in a brown coat who was walking around the house and was very annoyed that they had moved in. So they had, you know, they, they, they kind of took it with a little bit of uh, salt at, at, at the start and, um, you know, thought it was kind of cute and that the child had a bit of an imaginary friend going on or whatever. And as the days went on, uh, the, the child continued to talk about the man in the brown coat who was getting progressively more annoyed as they moved furniture and kind of painted places and restored the place. So um, it was beginning to creep the mother out a little bit, uh, in, in fact. And when the child wasn't there, she she had kind of feelings that maybe, you know, she was sort of being, being watched or, or those kind of feelings of other presences. So on one occasion then, they had moved a very large... Um, we, we, we'd call it a tall boy, a kind of a large chest of drawers, um, one of those old kind of dresser drawers. Uh, she had moved that into into a place on, on a landing uh, outside the child's bedroom. And the child kept telling them as they were moving it that the old man did not want the chest of drawers there. Um, so at that stage, the parents got kind of annoyed and gave out to the child and sent her to bed and said, you know, there's enough of that now. We're, we're, we're finished. You know, the man in the brown coat is gone. He's not to be there anymore. Anyway, about two, three o'clock in the morning, this was coming towards Christmas, uh, the child um, came into the room and said the man in the brown coat was outside on the landing and wanted to talk to them. And he was very annoyed as to where they had put his chest of drawers. So uh, the parents came out anyway and uh, told the child to go back to bed. And the mother said, for the last time, there is no such thing as the man in the brown coat. And at that moment, the chest of drawers fell over. Oh. Um, so at that point, they decided maybe they needed to seek a little bit of assistance. And they reached out to their friend, who was one of the, the, the monks, one of the friars. And he got in touch with me and the two of us went out to see them, uh, to see the house and to bless the house. And while we were there, it was there was a palpable presence in, in the house. Like it was just, it didn't reject us, but we, we knew it, it knew we were there. There was a very strong sense of kind of oppression. So we chatted to the little girl and she was fine. She was chatting away, all six years of age of her. And she was saying, he's very nice, but he, he, he doesn't like us being here and it's his house. So we asked for his name and she said, oh, I never I, I never asked his name. Uh, so she went off and came back a little bit later and she said she'd asked his name and she gave us his name. So we asked the parents, did the name mean anything to, anything to them? It meant nothing to them. Um, so she said, okay. So we continued with the the rituals and, and, and prayers and the oppression kind of left. And we, we said, look, if there's any more problems, call us back. But we think he's gone. So um, about two or three days later, the father in the house was putting the rubbish out, uh, taking the garbage out. Um, and uh, he met one of the old neighbours on the street. And the old man, being a good old man, had, had noticed these two monks arriving to the house some days before and was very curious as to what was going on. So he was asking him what was going on. And the younger man who was in the house, you know, didn't particularly want to go into the fact that about his daughter or the, the man in the brown coat or anything. So he said to him, he said, the young man said to the old man, um, you know, have you had anything strange in your house? And he said, oh yeah, we all have. Uh, he said the, these houses were built by a man back in the 1920s or 30s. But he said he's never really left. He's always been around. Uh, and lots of the houses have had problems with him. Hmm. So the young man was totally taken aback by this. This was not on the, you know, the, the, the realtor had not spoken about this as, as, they'd, as they'd bought their house. Uh, so he asked the old man, what was the name of the man who had bought, who had built the houses? And the name he was given back was the name that the little girl had produced. Um a couple of nights before, so that was just that was that was just coming up to Christmas, and um, 
what was beautiful about it was the neighbours all began to call into them to tell them that all of the manifestations in their houses had also stopped from the time that we had we had visited and offered the, the prayers for the for the man who had obviously felt very possessive of these houses he had built and wanted furniture and decor to remain the same. So um, that was a, a lovely moment of, and I'd certainly say it to your listeners as well, if they have, if they have younger children who are talking about invisible friends, um, to really listen to them uh, because there, there's uh, often they are just what we think they are in terms of children's imaginations, but we know the power of the imagination and it can certainly be used uh, as, as ways of connecting with with other things we, we have a fashion here at the moment i don't know if it's if it's reached the states but it's certainly a fashion at the moment where children are invited to put up fairy doors in their rooms or in their houses or in their gardens and to sort of name a fairy and to to call on the fairy to come in and it's you know these beautiful pretty little doors are sold to stick to your wall or to to um uh stick to the to the uh to the garden wall and I'm I'm waiting for the wave of calls we will get um, <laughs> as as uh, you know they're they're making effectively little shrines right. uh, to to genius loci uh, of some description and um, I've no doubt that some of them will will move in um, you know or at least manifest uh, so um, yeah when parents say to me that they're they're picking these things up for their kids I kind of smile away and say okay well enjoy. Um, <laughs> And, and we'll see how it goes, uh, because I think when it, when it, particularly when a child names something and calls it in, you know, it it it, it can arrive. It can yeah. come in with it. It's, yeah. Yeah. I was one of my favorite examples is there's a, a very popular uh, Bigfoot museum in Georgia, and uh, they put up this museum and filled it with Bigfoot artifacts and pictures of Bigfoot, and it's a place <laughs> where, where people come to share their stories about Bigfoot. And uh, they even have a very large piece of presumed Bigfoot scat under glass there. So, you oh, know, lovely. You, you know, <laughs> and uh, then suddenly they're getting tons of sightings around this. And it's like, sure. yeah, you, sure. you, you want Bigfoot? You, you just build a temple to Bigfoot, essentially. They've called it in. There, there's a, a paranormal researcher in, in the UK um, called Mike Hallowell. And he has written a beautiful book called Invisi Kids. Uh, which is specifically on the invisible friend uh, phenomena. And uh, he has related it hugely to the Fae, particularly um, as, a, as, as a kind of a working hypothesis. Um, he, he has designated um, invisible friends as what he calls quasi-corporeal companions, <laughs> um, which is a lovely, a lovely phrase. Yeah, but absolutely. Particularly around things like, um, you know, uh, them being invisible and intangible and yet able to affect matter at times mm -hmm. uh and it's, it's it, it is fascinating we had one case i remember um i didn't deal with it personally it was another friar dealt with it but where there was a child who had, there was a long corridor and she used to roll the ball along the corridor to her friend who would then roll it back Ooh, yeah. um so <laughs> when the mother spotted this happening she she uh, quickly called somebody in to ask um in as politely a way as possible for them to kind of uh, move on and, and leave leave her friend leave, leave her daughter alone so yeah how many people do you think in our audience got holiday puppies i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i think they're probably more there's probably more puppy getting this year maybe than other years i'm not sure there's a lot of people that are home more than they normally would it's be. It's true. Yeah. I know at the beginning of lockdown, they said there was a big surge in people getting puppies. I wonder if it continues. If you got a puppy or if you know someone who got a holiday puppy, 90 days to the perfect puppy would be a great gift to go along with that. They can help you train your puppy. They help you and your puppy become perfect for each other with their relationship-based approach to training. They have online sources, including video lessons, a secret Facebook group where you can interact with other puppy owners. Maybe they're going through some of the same difficulties as you and might have some advice and so forth. And of course, there are one-on-one -on -one options available as well. You can find 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. They can help you with potty training, mouthing and biting, fear and nervousness, barking, chewing on furniture, shoes, or other things the puppy shouldn't be chewing on, crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more. They'll teach you what to do 
and also, perhaps more importantly, they'll teach you what not to do. Again, that's 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. Find them at sithappens.us. Look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. The tradition of uh, Christmas ghost stories is mm-hmm. very, very strong and, and has faded over, you know, I think in, you know, I, I tend to blame Coca-Cola and, and uh, <laughs> you know, the sort of uh, saccharining, the saccharine nature of, of modern Christmas. Yeah. It, uh, it was a very strong tradition of Christmas ghost stories going back hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, it didn't start with Dickens in any means. No, no, no. Uh, very, very strong in Ireland. Um, the, the idea of, you know, sitting around the fire, particularly on the... The, the, the nights of Christmas, Christmas not just being one night, but 12 nights, uh, and, and each night kind of the story is getting more and more, um, you know, crazy about the, the, the fairies and the ghosts and all of that kind of stuff that was that was on the land. And th- there was even the, the tradition of what was called the Christmas invitation, which was, it was considered a very, very great blessing for someone to die uh, over the 12 nights of Christmas. Uh, and um, again, right up until quite recently here in Ireland, there would have been the, the, what they called the, the, the tradition of reading the death. In other words, that um, uh, they would tell the story of the death specifically looking for the signs that had come before it or around it so that people would sort of learn how to know when, when death was near and how to know when um, when to prepare oneself for death particularly. So, uh, yeah, uh, considered a very great blessing to die over that time. And that those those stories would, would get told over and over and over uh, within within families. And most families, most old Irish families would have um, particular um, sort of uh, sign givers uh, that would appear from the animal or bird world. You know, various families were associated with foxes, um, my own, my own mother's family was associated with the blackbird particularly, um, and to this day we have had really interesting manifestations of, of blackbirds just before um, the, the, the women of the family have, have passed on, uh, where, where they would uh, just be around and, and you know, be, be very um, present and coming into houses and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a time for the ghosts, it was a time for spirits, and it was, the understanding was as well that it was a time for mercy for the spirits. So particularly for those that were trapped or were caught or were condemned to kind of wander the, wander the world, if they could be invited in to Christmas celebrations, um, then uh, their, their sufferings would be alleviated and they would even be able to pass on into, into, into the more uh, heavenly um, realms. Uh, and so over Christmas Eve particularly, there was always the, the idea that um, a candle would, uh, would be set in the window and the doors would be left unlocked that night and very often bread uh, and um, milk would be left on the tables, um, in some places bread and beer. Uh, and that, the idea there was that if the Holy Family, um, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, were on their journey, they could call in, but also the ancestors could call in at any time uh, and partake of food and drink and know that they were welcome. Uh, so uh, it wasn't just the stories, it was the understanding that they would call, that they would be present. That is a beautiful tradition. Mm. And it kind of uh, segues into Taylor's next question, asking about Christmas rituals of the future or rituals we'd like to see come back into vogue. That's an absolutely beautiful one I, I would uh, like to see implemented. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the Christmas welcome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea of, of, of hospitality, not just to... Um, uh, to, to our family and our friends, but also to those who have gone before. Um, and there was that idea of a kind of a telescoping of events, you know, that, that idea that, that when you entered into sacred time, into thin time, eternity and chronological time become one in, in that moment. And so all of the generations are present. Um, and, and it becomes a way of kind of uh, renewing our, our acquaintance with those who have who have gone before, um, they'd often be invited to bless the land or bless the house or to, to make sure that the house was protected for the coming the coming year. In terms of other other rituals that, that, that maybe have gone, I mean, they're, they're often present, but we don't know why we're doing them. So even the, the idea of, of um, bringing in holly and ivy into the house, um, that was a very, very clear protection of the house against uh, evil spirits or fairy. And uh, the holly bough was, was considered to be a very sacred plant, uh, going back as far as the Celtic times, but even even uh, under the Christian uh, dispensation as well, it was seen as um, one of the, the plants that, that had been used within the crown of thorns. Um, 
And so uh, a male and female holly tree were often planted at the main entrance to a garden or to a house uh, as a way of keeping keeping um, evil spirits at bay. And so branches of it would be brought in and placed over the door and over the chimney. Uh, and we still do that to decorate, but we forget why it was actually why it was actually done. It was to, to protect the house at a time when the spirits would be out and about and moving so that only the good ones could come in because um, they couldn't pass uh, a holly bough or a holly bra- branch at that stage. Wow. I, I have chills. We have two holly trees planted out front. Uh, well, there you go. It was always considered to be a very good sign if you were moving house, if you came to the house and discovered that that uh, holly trees had been planted. Um, it was a sign of, sign of blessing of a house. Oh, wonderful. In, in fact... Um, uh, Tolkien even referred to the uh, to the tradition uh, with regard to Holly when in the Lord of the Rings they arrive at the famous um, the doors into the mines of Moria they discover two huge Holly trees uh, that had been planted there of old as a as a way of keeping evil things at bay but also um, as a way of of uh, announcing an alliance between uh, the dwarves and the elves I think it was at that stage but it, it goes back to that to that ancient idea that um, the trees were, were markers for memory and were also markers of they, they brought particular energies with them whereas ivy <clears throat> was seen as a very blessed plant because it's it's um, in the old language of, of plants it was considered to be a, a healing plant and a plant that indicated humility uh, and when the again the old Irish legends around the, the Christmas time uh, when uh, the Holy Family were fleeing into Egypt. They, they were supposed to have hidden in a cave and ivy grew over the front of the cave to hide them from the soldiers. And so ivy was considered to be a very blessed plant to have in the, in the house as well at that time. I think the Christmas welcome might hold, uh, to, to kind of step back and, and touch on mm. that again, might hold particular significance this year when, when maybe we can't see as many of our relatives as we'd like. Mm-hmm under this and uh, maybe that would, that'd be a way to sort of acknowledge mm. our, our relatives yeah. past and, and present yeah it's 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 it really is a beautiful idea and and um, the idea of kind of setting out food now the only thing i would just say to anybody who's going to do it food that was left out for for the holy ones or for the dead was never consumed by the living then afterwards yes that, uh, it was always distributed out to the land so that the animals could take it or it could go back into the into the land in whatever way it needed to it was considered to be to to be on untouchable by, mm-hmm. by, by humans after that. But uh, yeah, th- I mean, that was it. The latch was left off the door. The, the, the lamp was left in the window. Um, and to this day, in many of the churches uh, in Ireland, when it comes to um, Christmas Eve, there'll often be a special lamp or candle lit in the church uh, for those who can't make it, those who can't make it home. Uh, we're, we're a country of emigrants. And so it, it wasn't until very recently, you know, um, that people would kind of come home again for holidays or for Christmases they couldn't afford to and travel was too difficult. So lamps would often be lit in, in houses um, or uh, in, in the windows of houses and churches as a reminder of those of the parish who had gone elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, it, it might be a, a nice thing to do in, in these days when maybe people can't travel or don't want to break lockdowns or don't want to to bring um, the possibility of difficulty on, on older family members, etc., sure. who, who might be feeling isolated at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you kind of hit on this with the Sol Invictus mm. stuff, but uh, Alexander was uh, wondering about the pagan origins of Christmas. Again, I don't know mm. if I'm going to expand on that any further. And uh, Well, I, I suppose it's... I, I think it's, it's always dangerous to, to be to become kind of syncretistic about these things as though as though you're sort of saying it's 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 all one thing because i think that takes away maybe from the individual inspiration of the different the different traditions as well but i mean i, I suppose as human beings there is a very simple longing for light over darkness you know um we feel safer in the day uh, by, by and large and uh, particularly when you're dealing with um, an agricultural population in the in the northern hemisphere, um, the, the importance of light um, uh, for e- even just simply for food production becomes absolutely essential. Uh, so all of the various traditions have their festivals of light. I, I think tonight, as far as I know, is the first night of Hanukkah this year. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's think it's tonight. You know, you've D- Diwali in the in the, in the uh, Hindu tradition, um, and and all of the various um, 
uh, fire and light ceremonies that happen throughout the throughout the the, the year. I, I think what Christianity did um, when it met with the the pagan celebrations or the older classical celebrations was what it did in most places, which was to say, well, anyone who is seeking for the truth um, is seeking for the divine, whether they know it or not. And so anything that's good within those celebrations was preserved and continued. So uh, certainly there were elements of the older pagan uh, celebrations that were sublimated or you know, received by, by the Christian tradition and, and kind of given other significances or deeper significances uh, or newer significances, perhaps to say, maybe not deeper, but newer, certainly. And as I say, the the, uh, the great festival in, in, in Rome, the, the Saturnalian festival of the, 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 the victory of the sun um, was one that Christianity then took on and uh, said, yes, you were absolutely right to celebrate this and that this was a prophecy or a prefigurement of what actually happened in within the within the Christian tradition? Uh, that was the way it was viewed within the tradition, anyway. So, I think there there is there is a, a deep deep richness uh, to these traditions that when we scratch the surface, they go deeper and deeper and deeper, and eventually they just become essentially human. The the, the way in which we deal with uh, the natural world and the other and the divine and all of those things is is certainly partly a journey from darkness to light and from light back into into darkness again and this kind of cyclic nature of the year one of the oldest ways of of seeing this envisioned i suppose is within within the christian tradition we have the practice of what's known as the advent wreath um which is a, a wreath of evergreen leaves that's brought into the church uh, when we begin the advent season the four weeks of of preparation for christmas and on each of the four sundays then um a candle is lit around the wreath and there's all kinds of symbolism associated with it. Um, the evergreen leaves are supposed to represent the, the evergreen divine, the life of the, the, the divine life um, that lies beneath the surface, even in the midst of dark or, or desolate winter days. Um, the emptiness of this, the center of the wreath uh, is supposed to indicate, you know, d- divine emptiness, the, the inability of humanity to, to comprehend the mystery of God. And then the, the lighting of the four candles indicates the, the sort of the 4,000 years of longing from the moment that the Messiah is prophesied to the moment that the Messiah arrives. So you have all of the, these kind of elements of, of the growing of light, um, the, the, the circling of the ages, the evergreen idea. Um, but all of those traditions uh, are present within within the pagan tra- tradition as well. Um, you know, going as far back as the, the Yule log and the idea of um, burning the wood from last year so as to liberate uh, life into the land again, to bring life out of the land again. So I, I think when um, the, the, the various um, Christian missionaries and saints, etc., found these, these, uh, these things, they, they were very well able to see within them the possibility of a deeper illumination even of their own mystery. So I think there was back and forth over the the hundreds of years that have, have celebrated. We've kind of reinformed and reseeded each other along the way. Did you study, as part of your religious education, do you study pre-Christian religions? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's considered essential. Um, so the, the formal studies as such that we would do, uh, apart from the in-house kind of apprenticeship and, 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 and working within our own specifically Franciscan tradition, we would also, all of us do kind of, college level degrees in in um, philosophy and, and theology so I spent about four years doing a degree in pure philosophy and then four years doing a degree in 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 theology um, also taking other courses along the way but in both the, the philosophy degrees and the theology degrees part of it was um, a full kind of uh, very full very deep study of um, not just the Christian tradition but all of the other major traditions and uh, going back into um, what were known as the, the pre-philosophical religions, so that would have been back to the kind of um, uh, animist, naturist, uh, pagan uh, traditions that were present. Um, I, I also personally have made a fairly solid study of of Buddhism and Taoism as well, um, uh, and uh, a, a little bit, a little bit uh, in in terms of Judaism. But it was part and parcel of the courses that you would have to cover all of these these traditions as well, and and cover them from a very respectful point of view of recognizing that all of these traditions represent the reaching out of humanity for meaning you know for ultimate meaning um obviously i come from the christian tradition and within that the catholic tradition and 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 that's 
uh, where I am and, and, and what I am and how I've chosen to be. But if that tradition is lived fully, it should be lived in, in the fullest sense of the word Catholic, which means universal, the recognition of, of truth wherever it's found. All right, so let's move on to uh, Jen's question. She wants to talk about Mary Magdalene and okay, very good. The mysticism surrounding uh, Mary Magdalene. Okay, where do we start? Um, <laughs> so I suppose uh, starting from, from the historical, uh, scriptural point of view, from that point of view, we know very little about Mary, Mary Magdalene other than um, she's named as one of the female disciples of, of Christ. She is Mary of Magdala, um, and uh, I think as far as we know now, Magdala was, was a small town um, which was famous for a tower, uh, a Roman tower. So Mary is often known as Mary of the Tower, um, or Mary the Tower even, uh, indicating her kind of strength and courage. Um, she is uh, conflated and even confused with two other uh, women within within the gospel narrative sometimes. Mary of Bethany, who's the, the sister of um, Lazarus and uh, Martha, um, and also the woman who is uh, traditionally known as the woman caught in adultery. Uh, a name is never actually given to that, to, to that lady. Um, uh, so over time, and particularly through the medieval pageant play tradition, these three Marys were, were seen as one, which led, unfortunately, to the idea of Mary Magdalene as being a sort of a, um, a fallen woman or a repentant woman or that, that, that kind of idea. Whereas what we actually see in the scriptures is that Mary is named as a disciple. Um, and the only other information we're given is that we're told that Christ cast seven demons from her. Uh, and that's it. That's all that we're told. After that, we see her as an extremely faithful disciple, a uh, companion of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's present at the crucifixion and she is uh, gifted as being not the first witness to the resurrection, but the first public witness to the resurrection. It was a very ancient tradition in Christianity that the reason Christ isn't at the tomb when Mary, uh, Mary of Magdala arrives first is that the first place he went after rising was to visit his mother, to, uh, I suppose, console her after her having gone through the suffering of seeing him seeing him die. That's known as the one of the unknown mysteries. Um, so then Mary of Magdala becomes the first public uh, witness and is given the commission to go and to tell the disciples what she has seen. And since that day, she has received the title uh, in, in the Christian tradition of the Apostle to the Apostles. Uh, the word apostle means someone who is sent. So she is sent to the apostles to give the mystery, to give the, the proclamation of the mystery of the resurrection. After that, we simply have traditions and legends. Uh, and the, the traditions and legends say that uh, Mary, along with uh, Lazarus and Martha, this goes back to the conflation of her with Mary of Bethany, and she may have been the same person, we just don't know, that they were exiled as part of the persecution of uh, the, the early Christians. They wanted to to get rid of Lazarus particularly because he was seen as huge evidence of uh, the power of Christ, he having been raised from the dead, and that they were eventually end up in the south of France where they proclaim uh, Christianity and uh, work various miracles. Uh, Martha um, slays a dragon, uh, Lazarus sets up a kind of a, a church or a monastery, and Mary of Magdala, we are told, withdraws to the um, the mountains, to the desert, uh, to be a, a person of, of contemplation and prayer. Uh, and that's where I, I think maybe the strange familiars people uh, become very interested because we're told that she, she becomes effectively a kind of a, um, an image of, um, of, the, of the wild, of wild nature. It said that, that she lived out in the desert for so long that the clothes that she had fell apart and um, and so she was gifted with the grace of, depending on the translation you read, her hair becoming so long that it covered her body or that her body grew hair. And so she's this kind of wild woman of, of prayer and mysticism and, and miracles. We're told that daily she was raised up uh, into the sky uh, above the desert um, by angels so that she could uh, hear the sacred music of the spheres, the, the, the background divine music of all of creation. Um, so effectively she's seen as, as the, the sort of, um, having reached the acme of, of the contemplative journey, 
uh, and to this day is considered a um, uh, a model of of anyone who who wants to follow the the sort of the hermit way or the contemplative way. Again, more echoes for for strange familiars there. Yes. Her bones and uh, remains and some of her hair are still kept to this day in Provence in France, and there's huge devotion to her there. Um, she also then begins to reappear in the sort of the, 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 the more Gnostic tradition that begins to arise really in uh, the, the writings of the early 1900s or so, um, and this is a sort of a, a reappraisal of her, and this is where we begin to get the... Um, the sort of the Da Vinci Code, Mary Magdalene, who appears as uh, possibly the wife of Christ, who appears as um, the carrier of, of his bloodline. There's there's all of, of those kind of theories that are out there. Now, my problem in speaking about those is that for those who believe in those Magdalene mysteries, um, well, I'm speaking as a Catholic and I'm speaking as a Catholic monk. So anything I say after this could very easily be, be dismissed. <laughs> um, so all I'm simply going to say is if that is the Mary Magdalene that you are interested in, then I would suggest that you just go and study the history, like seek the truth. And, you know, if if uh, if that is is helpful to you, that's that's as much as I can say on it. What I would what I would say about her is that she is one of the most important saints there is, uh, one of the most important uh, female figures in, at, at the start of Christianity. Certainly, uh, her life and reputation um, were impugned uh, by male uh, teachers along the way who wanted to to render her a kind of a I sort of a sacred prostitute idea, I suppose, or a reformed prostitute, which there is no evidence that she was ever anything like that in in the scriptures. Um, and instead, if we look at the early church, she's just held up as an extraordinary example of virtue and grace and prayer and miracle working and um, and someone who is to be emulated um, by, by everyone, male and male and female alike. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's that's Mary of Magdala from from the mystical point of view. Um, as an archetype, she continues to be one of the great strong um, archetypes of what we would call uh, the divine feminine or the, or the 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 feminine in God, often seen within the the early uh, with late Jewish tradition and early Christian tradition as um, uh, Chachma or, or wisdom, Hagia Sophia in 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 the Greek. Um, and that idea, again, that uh, there are two paths to the divine. Um, there is the path of what they call the conversi, those who convert in life along the way and reform their their way of living. And the oblati, those who live a life of innocence and purity and truth uh, from the beginning. Interestingly, it was often said that a monastery only worked properly if it had an equal number of conversi and oblati. Um, you needed to have people who knew the world as well as those who, who, had, who had walked away from it That's uh, to keep it going. That's actually uh, very um, wonderful. So yeah, yeah it's, a good, it's a good balance. Uh, Alison um, is chiming in from the background and asking, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> Both, both. <laughs> in, in, that, that's what I'd say. Uh, particularly, particularly, uh, depending on, on what day of the week you meet me on. Um, but, but it's it's uh, it's definitely um, uh, the, as, again like with all archetypes, we find all of the archetypes in ourselves, uh, depending on on the circumstances we're in. But Mary of Magdala would have been seen as the archetype of the conversi, mm -hmm. um, whereas um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have been seen as the archetype of the oblati. Uh, in, in that sense so the fact that they both appear at the foot of the cross and they are both the witnesses to the death and and the resurrection of jesus is seen as as the sort of fulfillment of both sides that these are the two paths and that everybody can walk walk those two paths there's always room in that sense there you go i will uh, step back and just talk about the idea pre um uh da vinci code Hmm. I became interested in, in, in uh, these ideas and sure. and very you know cause I did a ton of research and, and all these books and, and everything. My the balloon was kind of deflated for me when uh, my bandmate you know and I'm talking you know these people they claim to have like the bloodline of Christ and I'm yeah. getting into all this stuff and then he he simply showed me the family tree of some yeah. of these, these royals <clears throat> and uh, th this was sort of the the you know, it's it's a fascinating story, but as, as far as me going any deeper, this is sort of the end of it. When you look at the family trees of these royals, and they'll go back, and they, 
you know, it's got as far as people could remember at the time, you know, their father, mm. their grandfather, maybe their grandfather's grandfather. Beyond that, it goes to pagan gods. Zeus, yeah. Zeus is often in the tree and and uh, hero, great heroes, you know, Hercules and Perseus and the and it goes back from there. And then it's figures from the Bible. Yeah. Uh, beyond that. So once you see these family trees that people put so much stock in, you go. Oh, yeah, they just weren't really good at doing family trees back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there, there was certainly um, a, a sense in which uh, they, they were trying to reconcile both the pagan and the Christian, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was always that question <clears throat> for the early Christians as to, um, you know, these figures of, of myth and legend, where did they fit in? Um, so you even have them stretching it towards, um, you know, one, one of the... <laughs> The, the, the famous interpretations of the Nephilim was was that they were the the, the, the classical heroes, you know, the Hercules right. and all of these kind of people were, were these, um, because how else could they have been? How else could they have existed? But I think for me, one of the things that always makes me slightly suspect is that once you get into a situation where you are saying, by virtue of blood or genetic descent, someone is more special than another person. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, the, the hackles on the back of my neck rise, and, and, and I think you, you begin to be very wary because you're, you're effectively into, um, you know, a kind of a, a hierarchy of humanity based purely on, on genetic descent. Um, and we, we all know where that goes. Yeah. You know, it becomes yeah. it becomes racism, it becomes eugenics, it mm. becomes Nazism, it becomes all of those sort of things. And while while it would be lovely to think that there is you know a pure uh, bloodline of uh, divine bloodline all the way through, the actual message of Christianity in its fundamental sense is, is that we are all one family with the divine, you know, and that that's that was what the incarnation was to do was to make us brothers and sisters to 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 the divine. So I, I think sometimes it can be people wanting to be more special. Or, or, to, or to, to sort of be able to set themselves up over others. Now, that happens within organized religion as well, just from the simple kind of hierarchy. There's a very old story one of our old um, masters used to say, used to teach, where he said, um, there were two apples on a branch, and they're looking down at all of humanity. And one apple says to the other, you know, those human beings, all they do is fight and kill and fight and kill. And eventually they're going to be gone. And then finally, we apples will take over the world. <laughs> Um, and the other apple says, yes, but which of us will be in charge, the red ones or the green ones? <laughs> um, you know, in, in other words, it's, it's part and parcel of, of the, the kind of um, fallen nature that, 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 that exists, that, that um, we, we constantly want to exert dominance over each other. And I think sometimes these kind of legends um, can be used to sort of give a, a, a reason or a philosophy uh, to be able to do that. And we need to be very careful of that, whether it's the Grail Quest, the Da Vinci Code, or even just broad mainstream religion in itself. Absolutely. Well, speaking of the Grail, Barbara asks about the <clears throat> mystic tradition of the Grail within Christianity. Sure. Okay. Well, for, first of all, the question I, I respond to whenever anybody asks me about the Grail is, which Grail? Um, <laughs> because there are many Grails. Um, I suppose the, the one most traditionally understood is, is, is uh, you know, the idea of the, the cup of the Last Supper. Um, so, uh, for those who who, who may not know, um, within Christianity, in all its various forms, one of the most important um, moments in the life of Christ is the Last Supper that he has with his disciples before he he, he dies, at which he offers uh, the, the the sacrifice of Passover, the Jewish Passover sacrifice. Um, within that meal, within that ritual meal, there is a cup known as the cup of thanksgiving. Uh, and that cup was very, very important. It was often, the physical cup itself was often handed down through through generations um, and was considered something very precious. So one could see it, it this, as being something that would have been passed down amongst the, the disciples afterwards. In time, that became known as the growl or the grail, which, which basically means a hollow vessel. And uh, that cup, um, you know, uh, within legend anyway, uh, was something that was passed down amongst the disciples. It was in the keeping of St. Peter uh, and um, was with him in, in Rome, and he used it to celebrate Eucharist regularly. To this day, there is actually an indication of that in the Catholic Mass, because in, in uh, the Eucharistic prayers that are used, the first Eucharistic prayer that's known as the Roman Canon, it goes back 
uh, elements of it go back to the second century. When it comes to the, the, the moment where the priest takes up the chalice to, to, to offer the chalice, in all of the other prayers, he just simply says, he took the cup. But in the Roman ca- canon, he says, he took this cup. Uh, and that is considered to, to be an indication that, that um, uh, in the words of Peter, he was showing the, 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 the disciples, the, the rest of the disciples, the, the actual cup of Christ in, in, in that moment. Now, what becomes of that cup afterwards, that's a matter of mixtures of history and legend. But the story is uh, that it came down eventually to... Um, the uh, the deacon Lawrence Saint Saint Lawrence patron saint of bakers, uh, and uh, Lawrence uh, as a martyr um, took it to uh, to Spain um, and it was hidden with the Christians in Spain during uh, an outbreak of persecution in Rome, and that chalice still exists to this day. You can see it if you want to Google uh, at any stage um, the, the the holy chalice of Valencia. Um, you'll see a very strange baroque looking looking uh, uh, chalice but if you look closely uh, the, the, the grail part of it is simply a, a little um, stone drinking bowl uh, which is the cup of, of the of the chalice itself um, and that is considered to be uh, the, the chalice that came from from Peter and that was the drinking cup now scientists have looked at it and they have said that it is definitely a first century drinking vessel from the Middle East that's as much as they can say. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, who knows? Uh, but it is exposed regularly in the cathedral in Valencia as um, as a good candidate for the grail, um, put, it, put it like that. The, the second grail is, is the Arthurian grail, the, the sort of the Arthurian legend. Uh, and that is a cup that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, it's often confused with the grail of the Last Supper as well. But the cup of Joseph of Arimathea was supposed to have been a cup that was used to collect some of the drops of blood that fell from, from Christ when he was on the cross. And so it was considered a great symbol of, of um, the redemption, um, as one could imagine. Once we leave the gospel narratives, Joseph of Arimathea becomes a man of great legend. He's supposed to have been um, a very wealthy man. He was supposed to have made his money through tin mining. Um, He is supposed to have gone to Cornwall and to to the UK, uh, which obviously would have been part of the Roman Empire at the time anyway, um, parts of Britain, uh, to obtain tin. And when the persecution of the the church in in, uh, Jerusalem began to take place, he is supposed to have fled to to, to England and to eventually have ended up in Glastonbury. And uh, if you ever have the chance to get to Glastonbury, I would thoroughly encourage it. I've been there there twice now on, on pilgrimage myself. It's an extraordinary place and a real place where all of the various traditions come together and where you can meet literally anything and anyone. Um, it's an extraordinary place of, of, for, for gathering of people there. But the belief there is that um, Joseph used the grail uh, to bless the waters of, um, of Glastonbury. And you can still go to what's known as the Chalice Well Gardens there and see the uh, uh, the, 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 the well uh, and the spring of water that Joseph blessed, along with planting his staff on Glastonbury Hill, which then became the famous Glastonbury Thorn Tree, um, a healing tree. There, there, are, there are a number of them around that are taken from cuttings of it. Sadly, the one on Glastonbury Hill, I think, was actually cut down by vandals um, some years ago. Oh, that's um, heartbreaking. Yeah, it was it was it was terrible. And uh, but thankfully, the tree, the tree itself um, continues because cuttings are are taken from it regularly in order to to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's one still growing within the grounds of of Glastonbury Abbey, which is also supposed to be the resting place of of King Arthur as well. So you have all of this mishmash of of biblical and Arthurian uh, legend there. But 